Well, some more news now from closer to home. And the Prime Minister has paid tribute to the Norfolk-born journalist Rupert Hamer, who was killed in Afghanistan on Saturday. Hamer, who was the defence correspondent for the Sunday Mirror, was embedded with the US Marines when he was killed by a roadside bomb. The 39-year-old went to school in Norfolk and started his career in journalism at the Eastern Daily Press. I know the whole House will also wish to join me in paying tribute to Rupert Hamer, who lost his life in Afghanistan while reporting from the front line, and to his colleague who was injured. And our thoughts are also with their families, friends and colleagues. We are grateful to all those who put themselves in danger to ensure that the world is aware of the bravery of those serving in Afghanistan. An escaped prisoner from Suffolk who taunted police on the Facebook website about his life on the outside has now been recaptured. 28-year-old Craig Lynch was serving a seven-year sentence for aggravated burglary when he then absconded from Hosley Bay Open Prison back in September. Police say that he was arrested in Kent last night. He's been charged with escaping from lawful custody. Now, people desperate to grit their icy driveways and freezing roads are taking sand from Suffolk's beaches. But there's a warning tonight that not only are they breaking the law, they could also be stealing from the Queen. Natalie Gray has this report. With gritting sand in short supply, it seems that people have been raiding Felixstowe Beach. Although the local council owns it, the area below the low tide mark is held by the Crown Estates, so people could be stealing from the Queen. Either way, it's illegal. I suppose if one person with a small bucket comes along and chucks it over their drive, there's a row. But if everybody does it, you suddenly find that you, you've got a depletion of sand on the beach. And a lot of money has been spent in refurbishing our beach because of the erosion problems that we've got. And really and truly, it would be better if people didn't do it. Meanwhile, sales of table salt have soared as customers try to clear slippery paths and roads. Valerie Balls from Alborough in North Norfolk is lucky to have some. Well, it's been terrible. You know, getting around or trying to get to the shop, the roads have been bad. And, uh, well, it's been just uh, awful. A local spa shop has been sold out for a week now. They've sold ten times the amount of salt they would normally sell in the last three weeks, but they're not sure when it's going to be back on the shelves. That's because their suppliers have run out too. There's also been a brisk trade in cat litter, which people have been using as an alternative to grit. Meanwhile, in Norwich, this supplier would normally sell two tonnes of rock salt over a winter. In the last three weeks, he's sold 30 tonnes before running out. And you've got another 16 tonnes coming today, and I gather that's all spoken for. That's correct, yeah. We've got 16 tonnes hopefully arriving today, um, and that has already all been sold. Um, we have another two tonnes coming in next Monday, and there's not much of that left now as well. The Environment Agency says salt and cat litter will do little long-term harm, but stealing from beaches could have major consequences on a coastline that's already seriously eroded. Natalie Gray, Anglian News, Felix Stowe. Yes, and Her Majesty will want the sand back as well. Yes, now, it's seven weeks since Kings Lynn hosted its last game of senior football, but it seems the wait for a new team in the West Norfolk town could be over. Yes, financial problems forced the Linnets out of business. But tomorrow, the local council, which owns the ground, hopes to announce who is set to run the reformed club. Donovan Blake reports. It's regarded by many as the original home of Norfolk football. But how soon will it be before the walks ground in Kings Lynn sees football again? With the current football business wound up because of an unpaid tax bill of nearly £80,000, site owners, Kings Lynn and West Norfolk Borough Council, hopes a new club will be introduced shortly, but under strict guidelines. We want to see that uh, a club is financially sound, that it knows where it wants to be and can afford to be where it wants to be, that it takes into account... The, the people who support it, the, the paying fans, and that it recognises the, the stake that the town has in, in Kingsland football. Kingsland Speedway promoter Buster Chapman is behind one of two bids to reform the club, which the council is considering. The other is led by supporters, the Blue and Gold Trust. A successful one will be unveiled tomorrow. KNFM 96.7, looking forward to find out the future of the Linnets tomorrow. Everyone the Linnets' disappearance from the football scene has been a huge talking point for those associated with the club and for those who live in the borough. We had lifelong fans calling us almost in tears. I remember one guy, I think his name was Graham, he, he, you know, he didn't have the money, but he offered £1,000 to keep the club afloat if another 64,000 people you know, came to fruition you know, to, to pay off the debt. Alas, never happened. 
The club was saddled with debts and last month they lost their appeal against a winding up petition in the High Court. So while the old Kings Lynn business is addressed, we wait to see who will spearhead the new club and when football at the walks will finally return. Donovan Blake, Anglia News, Kings Lynn. The future of one of Norfolk's last working windmills is still hanging in the balance tonight. The leaseholders of Denver Windmill near Downham Market say the business may have to close at the end of the month because of a dispute over maintenance. Today, though, they met with the owners, the Norfolk Historic Buildings Trust, who say that they are committed to keeping it open, but there's a limit on what they can spend. The trust is due to hold a board meeting at the end of the month to decide what to do. The six-storey corn mill was built back in 1835. Now, it was a case of celebration or disappointment for schools across our region today as the latest league tables were published. While every education authority in our region achieved better results than last year, it wasn't all good news. One school in our patch was actually named the worst performer in the whole country. But is it really that bad? Many are critical of the system, saying the figures reflect only a narrow part of the school's achievement. Victoria Webb's been hearing the stories behind the stats. Arriving at St Peter's College in Chelmsford, many of these pupils were already well aware of the school's reputation, but now the league table results officially place it as the worst performing in the country. While that doesn't come as a surprise to some members of the community, others were quick to defend it. I can only speak from experience. My daughter's been through the school from year seven into sixth form. I've never had a problem with the school whatsoever. St Peter's is actually due to close next year because of dwindling numbers. The national average for pupils receiving at least five A star to C grades at GCSE, including the key subjects of English and maths, is 50.7%. Here at St Peter's College, it's just 8%. That's down from 26% the previous year. The head teacher, Colvinda Chima, told us these statistics don't reflect his pupils' achievements and that many students gain qualifications which are not necessarily seen as GCSE equivalents but prepare them appropriately for future employment. The 2009 results reflect the large percentage who undertook these alternative courses and we are pleased for them and their success. On the other side of town, Newhall Independent School is on the opposite end of the scale and is celebrating today after 95% of its pupils received five or more A-star to C grades. One of the factors they're putting their success down to is teaching boys and girls separately. Nationally, 50.7% of pupils received five or more A-star to C grades, and there have been improvements right across our region. Hertfordshire achieved the best result, but the improvement was only 1.2%. Peterborough achieved the lowest result, but it was 3.4% higher than last year. The biggest improvements were seen in Milton Keynes and Northamptonshire, and particularly at the Northampton Academy. While today's league tables will help parents decide where to send their children, they're deeply unpopular among many teachers' unions. League tables are very damaging um, to schools, far, partly because they um, inevitably lead to a, a narrowing of, of, um, of the curriculum and, and a focus on the pupils who are most likely to achieve five grades A to C. Um, but when a school slips down the league tables and doesn't achieve well, it can be enormously um, damaging to morale. By 2011, the government wants 30% of pupils at every school to get five good GCSEs, including English and maths. Schools failing to do that will either be closed or turned into an academy. While there have been many improvements in the last year, there will also be those pulling out the stops to make sure they meet that target. Victoria Webb, Anglia News, Chelmsford. Yeah, it's a tough time for the schools at the moment, isn't it, with the league tables and also mm. coping with the snow as well. Oh dear, difficult. Indeed. Now